please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. <clears throat> then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. God bless the reading of your word. You may be seated. Well, good morning again. Um, once again, if we haven't met before, my name is Mace, and I have the pleasure of serving here as a church planning resident. Uh, in fact, it's been just about a year that my family and I have been here at Neartown, and we've been just so encouraged by the community here and the ways that everyone here that we've met has, has loved us and encouraged us well. Um, and this summer has been really exciting as we are have been putting the final steps in place to get ready to begin launching this church. In fact, uh, starting next Sunday, we're gonna host a series of vision nights, and we would love to invite each of you to one. I think we'll have a, a registration link up on the screen. Uh, and would love you to invite you to attend one of those to hear more about this vision that the Lord has placed on our heart about a new church in this city that we know and love, and for you to prayerfully consider how you might want to be involved, whether that's as a prayer partner or financial partner as one of our, or as a member of our core group, our mission team, um, to help be a part of this new church work. So it's been an exciting summer on the ministry front, and it's been an exciting last couple of weeks on the personal front. Just about two and a half weeks ago, on July 19th at 9.39 a.m., we welcomed the newest member of the Pettis family, Jude Elias. There he is, yeah. Um, he is doing great, but unfortunately he couldn't be here today because his big sister has a bit of a runny nose, so we just decided uh, to leave her home. So Jennifer, Haven, and Jude are, are hanging out at home while um, Bernard and I and some of our extended family are here this morning. Um, and it's just been such a sweet last couple of weeks. Uh, Jennifer, I am convinced, is a real-life superhero. She's just absolutely amazing. Bernard and Haven are, are just awesome big brother, big sister. Little man's doing great. And it's just been a reminder once again of how much I love being a dad. I absolutely love it. It's the, the best thing ever. But it's also the hardest thing ever. And uh, as I say that, that it's the hardest thing ever, it's, it's probably not for the reason that you might be thinking. Yes, you lose some sleep. Yes, you occasionally have to say no to some things that you might otherwise want to do. And yes, there's going to be times where you're just like beating your head against the wall because you have no clue what you're doing. Those, those are challenging to be sure. But by far, the hardest thing for me about being a parent 
is the number of times how repeatedly and profoundly I am reminded of my own indwelling sin. When I try to grasp for control in their lives. When I don't want to do something, frankly, just because I am a selfish human being. Or when I lose my cool with them out of frustration and impatience. And it's that, that last one especially that can often leave me feeling crushed under the weight of guilt, shame, and regret. And I bet we can all relate to, to those feelings, those feelings of guilt, shame, and regret, because they're, they're universal human experience. So maybe it's not as a, a parent in your case, but I bet we all know what it feels like to, to do something that we know that we're not supposed to do. Whether that's likewise losing your cool, often with the people we love most, whether that's crossing that relational boundary that you swore you would never do again, whether that's going onto that website that you know that you shouldn't be on, or whether it's telling a lie to avoid a, a consequence only to realize that the feelings of guilt, shame, and regret you feel after committing that lie is actually just worse than just owning up to it and facing the punishment that you, you justly deserve. So what do we do when we experience those feelings of guilt, shame, and regret? To answer that question, we're going to be looking at Psalm 51 as we continue our sermon series on the Psalm. So if you would uh, go ahead and open your Bibles to Psalm 51. If you don't have a Bible, uh, you can just pull out your phone, download a Bible app real, real quickly. Uh, we also have some Bibles out in the lobby for you up against the, the glass walls, and we would invite you to just have one of those as our gift to you. As you're working uh, on getting up Psalm 51, uh, the Psalms are found in the Old Testament, right about in the middle of the Bible. It's the longest book in the Bible. There's 150 of them, so hopefully you shouldn't have too much trouble as you're trying to make your way there. Um, just don't forget about that silent P at the beginning, right? Um, Psalm 51 is one of, there's, there's different categories of Psalms. We've been talking about this throughout this series. Psalm 51 is one of, and probably the most famous of what we call the penitential Psalms. By penitential Psalm, that we mean that the writer, the psalmist, in this case, King David, is expressing remorse and repentance over the sin in their lives. And in Psalm 51, the header actually tells us the exact situation that, that caused David to feel these feelings of remorse and to express his repentance. There's this infamous scene in David's life where he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And to make matters worse, he, he abused his position of power to not only commit that adultery, but to try to cover his tracks by conspiring to have Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, killed. And so in the aftermath of this, God sends the prophet Nathan to David to confront him about his sin. And when he does, David realizes the horror at what he had just done. And so this psalm was pinned in that, that aftermath as he realized the horror at what he had just done. And as we work through Psalm 51, as the title of our sermon series says, we're going to see how we can sing because and not in spite of the fact that we're feeling crushed under the weight of guilt, shame, and regret. Specifically, Psalm 51 is going to help us answer two foundational questions. One, what is sin? And number two, why do we sin? And as we begin to, be, as we begin to understand those things, as we begin to understand what sin is and why we sin, that it will help us understand what do we do when we sin, and especially when we're feeling crushed under the weight of guilt, shame, and regret in the aftermath of our sin. So as we look at the very first verse, we're going to get some powerful clues that help us begin to answer these questions. So Psalm 51, verse 1, says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. And so first, this very first verse in this psalm is going to help us begin to understand what sin is. There's three words used throughout this psalm to describe sin, and one of them occurs in this verse. It's the word translated in the ESV as transgression. A transgression is a violation of a moral law or a crossing of a moral boundary. 
To transgress in the English language literally means to step across. So if a stranger were to just come waltzing through my gate into our backyard unannounced, without warning, without permission, they would be committing a transgression. They have unlawfully crossed a boundary. And so it is when we violate God's moral law. Sin is violating God's moral law. And then this verse, with an understanding of what sin is, begins to help us understand what to, to know what to do when we sin and when we experience the fallout of sin, guilt, shame, and regret. We ask for mercy. In other words, we ask for forgiveness. When David asks for his transgressions to be blotted out, he means for his record to be wiped clean. In other words, to be forgiven. And David knows that he can go to God and ask for forgiven, not because of who David is, but because of who God is. He says, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. We've talked about that, that Hebrew word that's translated steadfast love a number of times throughout this series. It's the Hebrew word hesed. And it describes God's loyal love to his covenant people. And David knew this to be true about who God is. He knew that God is a God of steadfast love and a God of abundant mercy because he knew the Torah. He knew the story of scripture that starts in Genesis. And he had seen time and time again how God had been faithful to his people and how he had kept his promises to his people time and time again, even when God's people seemingly did everything in their power to negate it and mess it up. So David knew that if he came to God with a truly repentant heart, which he did, that he would be forgiven. And part of the good news for us here this morning is that if God could forgive David, an adulterer, a murderer, he can forgive you. He can forgive you for lashing out in anger. He can forgive you of your pride, your arrogance, your selfishness. And he can forgive you of your sexual sin. But we need more than just forgiveness because while we need forgiveness, if that's all we receive from the Lord, we're just gonna keep going on sinning. We're just gonna find ourselves in the same mess even if it comes in a different way another time. David knows this as well. And that's why he says what he says in verse two. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And here in verse two, we find the second and third words that David uses to describe sin in this uh, psalm. So the second word, we've talked about the word transgression. The second word is the word iniquity. And iniquity is an unjust act. In other words, to commit iniquity means to do what is not right. But it's more than that, because when we do something that is not right, we incur guilt. So iniquity can also be used to describe those feelings of, of guilt that we experience in the aftermath of our sin. And that's why David says that he needs to be wiped clean, that he, he needs to be cleansed. When someone commits a crime like deep, uh, you know, theft or, or murder, they not only break the law, they owe a legal debt to society. And when they're convicted, a criminal record is established. And the only way that they can escape the punishment due to them because of their sin, because of their debt to society, because of their cr criminal record, is to have that record wiped The other word for sin, we talked about transgression, we talked about iniquity. The, the third word that we find in, in various forms throughout the psalm is the word simply translated as sin. And if you've been around church for a while, you've probably heard that to sin means to miss the mark. And this is the word that we, we get that from. So at the time that I was uh, working on this part of the sermon originally, the Astros had just lost a heartbreaker on a, a throwing error. And I will save names to protect the guilty, um, but what happened was that player had thrown the ball, but they had missed their mark, and it was costly. And that's the same thing that happens to us when we sin, only the consequences are much more dire. We were made to aim for something. That in Genesis 1, the Bible talks about how God created the heavens and the earth, and he created humanity. He created us in his image. 
And what that means is that we are meant to be God's representatives here on earth. We're meant to, to rule over creation on his behalf, and we're meant to reflect his character, his love, his kindness, his goodness. But the problem is we have all missed the mark. We have all sinned. We've all failed to perfectly reflect and represent God's character to those around us. That's what it means to sin. It means to live in such a way that is contradictory to God's character. And so as we, we look at all these words throughout this psalm that David uses to describe the, the concept of sin, we start to get a fully formed idea of what sin is, that it's to violate a boundary or a moral law, that it's to do what is not right and to incur guilt, and it's to miss the mark that we were created to aim for. And David knows that he needs more than forgiveness for his transgressions, for his iniquities, for his sins. And so, yes, he asks for forgiveness, but he goes further and he asks for cleansing. So when we sin, we ask for forgiveness and we ask for cleansing. We can be forgiven uh, by those that we've sinned against on the outside, but we still have to be restored from sin's effect on our souls on the inside. David cries to God to do this work because he knows that we are ultimately powerless to make this change on our own, in our own strength. But part of the good news of the gospel is that God can and God will change us if we will let him. The gospel offers more than forgiveness. It offers the power to change. You can become a patient and servant-hearted person. You can live a life of sexual purity. You can live a life free from addiction. So we ask for forgiveness and we ask for cleansing. And we can delight, like David, knowing that when we come with a humble heart and we ask for forgiveness and we ask for cleansing, God will give it to us, even if that transformation process is frustratingly slow at times. David knows he needs forgiveness and he knows he needs cleansing because he knows the depths of his sin and our sin. Look at verses three and four. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So we've talked about what sin is, iniquity, transgression, but the most important verse in this entire psalm, one of the most important verses in the entire Bible to understand what sin is at its essence, at the most fundamental level, is verse four. And when we read this, this verse, it, it might kind of strike us as odd or, or even like horrific at first. How in the world can David say that the only one that he has sinned against is the Lord? He's an adulterer, he's a murderer. He sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Uriah. How in the world can David say that he only sinned against the Lord? Well, here we have to keep in mind the entire counsel of God on this topic. And as you read through scripture, God absolutely does hold people accountable to the wrongs they commit against others. And you look at places like Genesis 9, 6 to see that. But the point of Psalm 51, and uh, Psalm 51 verse 4, and I, I think we have to remember that this is poetry. I think David is using hyperbole here to get his point across. The point of this verse is to say that sin at its essence is rebellion against God. Because it's God's law. It's his moral boundaries that we break. It's God's character that we misrepresent. And even when we sin against others, we're sinning against people created by God and created in his image. Sin at its essence, sin at its most fundamental level is rebellion against God. Tim Keller says it this way. Sin is like treason. If you try to overthrow your own country, you may harm or kill individuals in the process, but you will be tried for treason because you have betrayed the entire country that nurtured you. So every sin is cosmic treason. It is overthrowing the rule of the one to whom you owe everything. So we're starting to understand what sin is as we're looking at this psalm. But why do we sin? Why do we sin against God and others? Is it just because we need 
more education? Is it just because of the societal and, and cultural and familial upbringing that we were brought up in? The answer that the Bible gives, the answer that this song gives, is much worse than that. Because it goes even deeper into the very heart of the human condition. Look at verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, to be clear, David is not pinning the blame for his sin on his mom. He's not saying that he's the product of some illicit relationship. We see no evidence of that throughout Scripture, and it, that, that idea would not fit with the flow of thought in this psalm at all. What David is saying in Psalm 51, verse 4, is that the only person he has to blame for his sin is himself. And likewise, the only person that we can blame for our sin is the person that we see in the mirror. We are the problem. The answer to the question, why do we sin? We are sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. Charles Spurgeon said on this verse, speaking of this verse, he says, it is as if David said, not only have I sinned this once, but I am in my very nature a sinner. The fountain of my life is polluted as well as its streams. In other words, our sinful acts are the symptom, not the disease. So if you were to, to sit there holding your, your coffee cup in your hand and, and your neighbor accidentally bumped you and the coffee came spilling out, why, why did the coffee come out of your cup? On the one hand, in some sense, yes, it's because the person next to you bumped it. But more fundamentally than that, the reason why coffee came out of the cup is because there was coffee in the cup. So all of the challenges, the trials, the situations you find yourself in life are real. They have real consequences. But the most that they can do when it comes to your sin is bump your cup. And if when your, your cup is bumped, sin comes out, it's because there was sin in there to begin with. It's what's inside our hearts that causes us to sin. And acknowledging that is the first and most important step towards healing and wholeness. Look at verse 6. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. God is not looking for perfection. He's looking for humility. He's looking for honesty. He's looking for people who humbly acknowledge their own imperfection, who acknowledge their sin, who acknowledge their utter dependence on God and his grace. David knows he needs grace. He knows the healing and cleansing power of the Lord. Look at verse 7. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. So hyssop was a, a small plant that was used to apply water or blood in the, the healing rituals uh, in the, the Levitic, Levitical law. And David's using that language to describe the spiritual cleansing that he needs through forgiveness. And then David describes the, the result of the forgiveness that he knows that he will receive because of God's grace in verse 8. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let, let the bones you have broken rejoice. And then he continues on with his, his pleading with the Lord, and starting in verse 9. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And then perhaps the most desperate cry of the entire psalm come, comes in verse 11. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. So in the New Testament era that we, we find ourselves in, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, permanently indwells the body of Christ, the church. But in the Old Testament, 
The Holy Spirit only came temporarily on people to empower them for the work of service. We see that throughout Scripture. Everything from building the tabernacle to prophesying to, to ruling the nation. And there's examples as we look throughout the Old Testament of God taking that Holy Spirit empowerment away from people. And perhaps the most famous example and most certainly the one on David's mind in this verse was King Saul. So King David, who wrote Psalm 51, was the second king of Israel. King Saul was the first king, and he started out pretty good. But over time, he let his pride and his arrogance get in the way. He started trying to rule in his own wisdom instead of the wisdom of the Lord. And finally, the Lord rejected him and revoked his kingship. And in 1 Samuel 16, 14, it says that the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So, for us, as New Testament believers, Psalm 51, 11 is, is, has nothing to do with uh, eternal security, assurance of salvation. It's not saying that New Testament believers can lose their salvation. It has everything to do with the fact that David is acknowledging that his very existence, much less his kingship, is entirely owing to God's grace and providence. And the only way that he can keep this kingship is through obedience. And the only way that he can be obedient to God is likewise through God's grace, which is exactly what he says in verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. So not only is forgiveness for our disobedience an act of God's grace, even our willingness and ability to be obedient is owing entirely to God's grace. That's why God alone gets the glory which is exactly what the next three verses are about. Look at verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from my blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Notice both the, the vertical and the horizontal dimensions of, of this praise that David is describing. So we say and we sing praises to God and we speak and sing aloud about God and his grace to one another. So when we sing together on Sunday mornings like we were just doing earlier and like we will do again in just a few moments, we are singing to God, but we are also reminding one another of God's goodness and God's grace. And we're pointing one another back to God. And it's when we humbly acknowledge that all the glory belongs to God and none of it belongs to us that God's heart is pleased. Look at verses 16 and 17. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. As we've already said, God is not looking for perfect people. He is looking for people who are humbly in tune with their imperfection, their need for God's grace. Sadly, some of the people who are the worst at this are church people. That for many Christians, and none of us is immune to this, me as well, our religious actions like reading the Bible or, or praying or going to church or serving, which are all wonderful, good things that we, we should be doing, but if we're not careful, those just become new ways of trying to justify ourselves, of trying to be our own saviors, of, of trying to prove to ourselves and to the people around us that, that we are good people. And that was true in ancient Israel as well. They thought as long as they went through the religious motions, the state of their hearts didn't matter but nothing could be further from the truth. The heart is the most important thing to God. Tim Keller says that the broken and contrite heart that God wants is a heart that knows how little it deserves, yet how much it has received. It is one that knows both how lost and how loved we are. And when we know and understand how much we've received despite how little we deserve, when we know and we understand and we experience how loved we are despite of how lost we are, 
the natural response of the human heart is praise. Finally, David extends these requests from himself to the entire nation of Israel. Verses, excuse me, verses 18 and 19. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and the whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. David knew that as a member of the community, even more so as the king, his sin had an effect on the entire nation. So David asks for God's favor on the capital city of Jerusalem. Zion was uh, once a, a, a term for just a fortified portion of the city before the time that it was under control of the Israelites, but it came to be a, a figurative name for the entire city, especially when talking about God's future restoration of the people of Israel. It was a city where David had placed a tabernacle and where the, the Israelites would have brought their, their sacrifices and their offerings to the Lord. And so as the, the Lord does good to the people of Israel, they will worship him there. And so it should be with us. As the Lord does good to us, especially as he forgives us of our sin and transforms us to, to the image of likeness of, of Jesus, we should praise him, not just individually, but corporately together. So what do we do when we sin, when we experience the fallout of sin, when we feel crushed under the weight of guilt, shame, and regret? We run to God in his grace. We ask for forgiveness we ask for cleansing. We praise him knowing that when we come humbly and honestly, we will receive grace. We will receive forgiveness. We will be cleansed. And ultimately, that's all possible only because of Jesus. Jesus, the son of God incarnate. He's the only one who lived a perfect, righteous, sinless life. He's the only one who perfectly embodied the righteous character of God. He's the only one who was perfectly obediently, obedient to God's law. He's the only one who hit the mark. And yet, though he was sinless, he went to the cross. And that's the only reason why God could forgive David. And it's the only reason why God can forgive us. God's forgiveness is not him wiping uh, sin under the rug. The penalty of sin must be paid for. And it has by Jesus on the cross. The cross paid the debt for your anger. The cross paid the debt for your impatience. The cross paid the debt for your selfishness. And the cross paid the debt for your sexual sin. And the proof that our debt has been paid in full was the resurrection. That after he died on the cross on the third day, he rose again, proving that our debt has been paid in full. And all you have to do to be completely and eternally forgiven is to admit your need of a savior to admit the sin in your life and to believe that Christ and Christ alone is your Lord and Savior and that his life, death, and resurrection are enough for your salvation. So if you've never trusted in Christ and Christ alone as your Savior and Lord, if you've never asked him for forgiveness of sin, you can do that right now. In just a few moments, we'll have prayer partners stationed throughout the room would invite you to go talk with one of them and, and, and talk to them about what God's stirring in your soul, the conviction that he's stirring in your soul and about what it looks like to place your faith in Jesus and to walk as a disciple of Jesus. Or talk with it if you, if you are here on the invite of maybe someone you know who loves Jesus and invited you to be a part of the service, talk to them about it over lunch today. And for those of us in this room or walking on, uh, online that you, you have placed your faith in Jesus. You have received forgiveness of your sin. My encouragement to you would be this. When, not if, but when you sin and you are once again crushed under the weight of guilt, shame, and regret, open your Bible. Turn to Psalm 51. 
and make David's words your words. Run to God in his grace. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for cleansing. And praise him knowing that because of Jesus, you will receive it when you come humbly and honestly. God is a God full of mercy, abounding in steadfast love. So don't run from him. Run to him. And let's do that now as we pray. Father, we can hardly fathom the extent of your love for us, that though we were dead in trespasses and sins, you have made us alive in Christ. By grace we have been saved through faith, not a result of work so that no one may boast, but because of Jesus' work on the cross. Through his life, death, and resurrection, we can have forgiveness, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be cleansed and we can be transformed to be people that look more like your son, Jesus. And even though that process can be painfully and frustratingly slow in this life, Lord, we know that because of Jesus, we likewise one day will be resurrected to eternal life, the new heaven and new earth with glorified bodies and fully cleansed and redeemed hearts. Completely in spite of all the things that we have done and will continue to do to mess it up, Lord. Help us understand your grace just a little bit more this morning. And in the future, as we undoubtedly will continue to fall short, Lord, remind us that we don't have to run from you. We can run to you and find grace and forgiveness and cleansing. And as we do, Lord, may our hearts overflow with praise to you your goodness, and your grace. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.